Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Cal. How's everyone doing today? Yeah. Great. Um, I'd like to welcome Gene Anderson to the <coughs> meeting this morning. He's going to be our speaker. Gene Anderson has uh, been part of the Oval Pilots organization for 17 plus years. And he's also an active member in both of our sister organizations in Rancho Bernardo and Oceanside. Gene Anderson has a day job working in the tech field and actually system security at, and teaches at UC San Diego. But his love is flying and history. And he, several years back, got introduced to the movie industry through some uh, pilots and uh, movie producers and got turned on to the idea of researching the uh, historical background of 12 o'clock high. And what you're about to see this morning is the result of his research. And we're looking forward to a fantastic presentation. I'd like to welcome Gene Anderson. Hi. It's, uh, it's good to be here. Um, I was uh, fine when I got out of the parking lot, but they started filming this, and I uh, just want to remind you that uh, the camera does add 40 pounds. So, <laughs> and I uh, uh, started researching this um, uh, 12 o'clock high uh, a dozen years ago. Uh, got my brother-in-law, Wally. We decided uh, back in the last century to marry these uh, sisters in Tacoma. And uh, so we've, uh, we've got stories to go back a ways. Uh, and, uh, I talked to Patrick. Well, I was here for the uh, presentation of uh, Bird Rutan, and so I talked to Patrick and, uh, before that. And I tried to convince him that I should be here to jump out of the cake, uh, but then when he saw me, he said, no, why don't you do this instead? <laughs> so, uh, and then uh, I'm all dressed up uh, for you here. Uh, Wally and I, after this, uh, we go and shoot clays out at uh, the Redlands uh, Shooting Park. So. Uh, my wife has uh, sort of reduced that down to, uh, oh, so you're going to go out and make boom boom with Wally. So, uh, so I mean, that's uh, one of the sisters that, uh, that we married into. So uh, I never felt like an instructor until I had my first laser pointer. So this is a, uh, this is a 40 kilowatt laser that uh, will actually take down uh, incoming missiles uh, as well, so if anything uh, is inbound, just let me know and we'll, we'll shoot it down. <laughs> um, so uh, this isn't my day job, but I kind of wish it was, so I'm sort of a wannabe as well. Uh, and this poor badge has been around since 97, so it actually does have glue and it's been cracked a few times and my wife keeps uh, getting it back uh, to where it's wearable again, so I'll, I have to watch. Oh, I'm good on time here. so. And uh, the one thing that uh, when I give presentations and I use uh, commercial material, I am allowed to do that under the uh, U.S. Patent Office as an educator. So in playing movies and other stuff, I gave a presentation last month. That was the reason why I wasn't here. Last month I gave a presentation to uh, the FBI on uh, how to deal with the insider threat. Uh, on uh, cybersecurity. So I actually have that brief on here. So uh, if you want to see uh, how we deal with the insider threat, uh, uh, we can talk about that. So um, anybody remember Ray Tolliver from, uh, uh, he's, he's gone now, but he was one of the, uh, the guys that helped uh, put together the Oceanside uh, group. It wasn't formed by him, but once Ray joined that group, it really started gathering a lot of people that meets every Wednesday in Oceanside. And so uh, Ray is a, he, you probably have a couple of his books on your bookshelf. Uh, he wrote The Blonde Knight of uh, uh, Germany, <coughs> by Eric Hartman, uh, 350 Kills, you may remember that, that book. He wrote The uh, Interrogator uh, about Hans Scharf. Hans Scharf's son comes every Wednesday in Oceanside. Um, so Ray was on the phone with Hans when he died. So I mean, I mean, there's I, shit. I got stories, and so uh, so this is where I began. Um, so I started talking with Ray, who kind of let me into the inner circle uh, about uh, some of the famous pilots, uh, and um, I talked to him about writing a book about the movie Twelve O'clock High. So he was the one that kind of went, Gene, go it, you know, do it. Don't don't be don't be shy." So I started making some phone calls, and the first guy I talked to was Russell Strong. And uh, he wrote uh, First Over Germany about the 306th Bond Group. 
uh, which is really kind of the basis uh, for this movie. And we, that's what we're going to get into. Um, then I picked up, uh, Russell introduced me to Alan Duffin. Uh, Alan Duffin is a uh, producer of, uh, I don't know, maybe 40 films. Uh, if you go to his website, aduffin.com, you'll see uh, uh, the books he's written. Uh, he wrote a book um, uh, about uh, the book, the TV series, and the movie. Uh, so anybody remember uh, Robert Lansing from all that? Paul Berg? Paul Berg, okay, yeah. Um, so uh, I've interviewed Paul Burke um, at, uh, before he passed away over at Palm Springs. You guys probably remember then Paul Burke attending it, the TV the, the actor, okay. Jim Farmer lives out in Covina. He wrote uh, Celluloid Wings. Um, and so I went uh, back and talked about uh, all of the movies up until the mid-70s that uh, had to do with aviation. And, and just there's tons of stuff that, uh, that never survived. The celluloid just, just went away. Um, and then uh, Chuck Dunning uh, works for Fox down in San Diego. Uh, he wrote some magazine articles about uh, the movie 12 Clock High. Uh, Roger Freeman, um, he's uh, passed away now. But I went out to dinner with him and Mark Copeland. Anybody remember the name Mark Copeland? He was the president of uh, the 8th Air Force uh, Historical Society for a while. So I'm drinking buds with, uh, with Mark. Um, then Bruce Orris uh, is the one that's uh, uh, restoring a B-17 for one of the museums. He's a, his day job is with Northrop Grumman. Uh, uh, Mike Faley, probably remember that, 100 Bomb Group, uh, does the presentations. Uh, he's president of the 100 Bomb Group uh, uh, Society, the Historical Society. Um, and so I had planned on writing this book, and I don't know if there's any lawyers or you know of any lawyers, uh, but um, I ran smack dab into the uh, uh, the legal department at Fox Studios, where I was going to uh, use about 400 uh, photographs, uh, some of screen captures. They said no, you can use six. So uh, that's uh, that stopped me from completing the book. So the good news, I don't have a book to sell you at, at the end of this. So how's that? So about the authors. Um, both of these guys, uh, Bern Lay and Cy Bartlett, did a lot of writing in the 30s and 40s. And so, uh, but they were both on the staff of the 8th Air Force from the beginning, which uh, formed in Savannah in February. Uh, Ira Eaker put that, that together. I've actually been in the hallway uh, of where those guys met, uh, Mark Copeland and I. Um, we uh, were able to, it was on the second floor of that building in Savannah. Um, so we were just kind of, uh, kind of soaking in the moment of uh, all that uh, history. And, uh, for some reason, uh, I have some fascination for this time period. Uh, my wife says I was born uh, uh, 30 years too late. We've been married uh, 40, 43 years. And I would go back, but I wouldn't want to give up modern dentistry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, cause I remember dentistry from the 60s, and oh god, that was terrible. <laughs> um, army, army dentists in the 60s, you know, with the, the syringe is that long and about that wide. And, so that's what I remember. So I don't want to go back and give up the, the dentistry that we have today. Um, <laughs> Jim Farmer interviewed Bern Lay. Um, only kind of the magazine. <clears throat> so I've got this depicted on, I think. Uh, yeah, the, the next slide. But this month's uh, issue of Air Classics has Jim's um, article that he wrote. And uh, he lives in Covina. Um, and so anyway, this is, it features a picture of the Toby Bug uh, that's on here. So if you pick up, uh, don't steal this copy. <laughs> so, um, so these guys are active. Uh, and I swim in this, in this circle of people that uh, uh, that really uh, dedicated uh, a lot of time to doing research. I actually personally picked up uh, Alan Duffin's uh, research material. He did his master's thesis, like I said, on the, on the book and uh, the TV series and the movie. So I've got uh, 
his box of research materials. So that actually could be another whole day's worth of uh, talking about that. Cy Bartlett, um, he wrote a bunch of screenplays. Um, this, and he had exposure to what, um, I don't know what you guys called it uh, back in the 50s and, and, and 40s. You know, we call it tough love now, and uh, my master's is in management from USC. Um, but did you guys have a name for this really stark leadership like LeMay and those kinds of, did you guys have a name for it? Tough? <laughs> I don't know, assholes? I don't know. <laughs> okay. So, um, I don't know, do you, can you, did you have any specific name for it? Okay. So, um, but it's interesting because um, Cy went on to write uh, Gathering of Eagles, remember Rock Hudson, do you remember oh, yeah. that? Mm -hmm. The movie. Yeah. So it's this, this similar kind of theme. Um, so um, I went into the Air Force in 1970, I was part of SAC. Uh, I can't say that as an enlisted guy making bombing charts that um, uh, that's when telling keyhole really was a code word. You know, so now you get keyhole markup language, and, you know, so. Um, <gasps> These are top secret codes. So, um, so anyway, um, I can't say that I experienced that kind of leadership. Uh, my dad uh, was in the Air Force uh, for for 20 years. He looked. Would you say my dad kind of looked like Gregory Peck? Yeah. He did. So I got to tell you, in terms of my dad, and uh, I remember. Yeah, he was tall, thin, good-looking guy, chiseled face. And I remember when my parents would go play bridge, the wives of these guys going up to my dad and say, anytime. So I mean, my dad was a good-looking guy. I didn't inherit that. I wasn't his best work. So, um, so anyway, uh, Cy Bartlett went on. He uh, actually went without permission. Uh, and I got a feeling that he got the worst of, of that kind of leadership getting Dressed down like the, that one depiction of uh, um, Gately uh, in the movie. So you guys have seen it. Anybody, have, anybody have, has not seen 12 O'Clock High? Get it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you'll definitely um, want to pick up a uh, you know, copy of the CD. I mean, it's, it's, it's really a classic. So you'll get some snippets here. Um, so this is the article uh, written by Jim Farmer. If you get a chance to pick it up, uh, your classic magazine just came out. That's Jim right there, retired school teacher. This is what's of interest to me, personally. Between February and July of 1942, I don't know why. I read about it. I talk to people about it. I've got some connection. I don't know, anybody else feel like there's something really fascinating about that time period when these guys are trying to figure out how are you going to defeat Germany? You've got the British telling them to do their bombing at night. Uh, you've now got a new bomber, the B-17, coming out. They had E-models at that time. Um, and so they were forming the group in Savannah, and they had set expectations with uh, uh, George Marshall and uh, with um, uh, Harris and you know the other British leaders that they would be bombing by the 4th of July. Well, by the 4th of July, they had one airplane in, in, uh, in England. And I know. So you've got to imagine that Eaker and uh, Spots and uh, Hap Arnold and all that time were just having their lunch eaten every day wanting to know when they're going to start bombing. And the British are saying bombing at night. They talk, start talking about bombing during the day. They haven't. Uh, they don't have any crews there. They don't have any airplanes. The uh, airfields are just being built. And uh, so Cruzland uh, was the the first casualty. Is that Eker came to the 97th bomb group uh, in Polbrook <laughs> and found out that they were um, on the regular circuit for having parties uh, at the local aristocracy. Uh, of the British, um, it was a pretty loose group, and uh, they needed to be, um, they expected to be bombing within the month, and this guy was, was really uh, underperforming, so he was canned. So that was the first takeover by uh, Frank Armstrong, 
And there's a segment in the movie that I'm going to play that has uh, uh, Eaker telling Frank Armstrong, hey, I'm going to need you to take over the Bond group again. And that occurs uh, at the uh, first week in January, where Overacker has got a hard luck group, the 306 Bond group uh, stationed at Thurley. And so um, I've been to Thurley, I've walked around um, the airfield uh, in places that I was told I wasn't supposed to be, so they picked me up and kicked me off the base, so you're not supposed to be walking here. And so um, it's now a, like an autodrome where they uh, test race cars and, and things like that. Anybody been to Thurley? Yeah? No? Liar. No. <laughs> so, um, so the one key thing that uh, Gregory Peck plays for sure in the movie is some aspects of Colonel Frank Armstrong. The other, we're at the end of the movie towards where he's having this nervous breakdown, is a guy named Newton Longfellow. And there is a book um, called Forged in Fire by uh, DeWitt Kopp. Um, it's kind of a thick book. It's in the trunk of the car. And Newton Longfellow, from what I understand, was a raving lunatic. Anybody ever meet him? Um, was a ranting, raving guy that was the head of the, the bomber, um, bomber command for that. So he had the wings, had a one star. And um, he burned himself out right in June of 43, and they replaced him. So, um, and so as the uh, Colonel, as Gary Merrill plays Overacker here, who uh, was part of the Hard Luck group, but his, uh, the crews on the base, so he was flying from uh, about October to January, and he was over-identifying with his men. So the crews loved him, but he, uh, the morale was low, they had uh, very poor bombing results, a lot of uh, B-17s getting shot down, and so he was the second casualty, and then uh, with uh, Longfellow uh, having the nervous uh, breakdown, he, uh, they were the third casualty. So this occurred from summer uh, to summer. So this was a really interesting time for uh, <coughs> So, uh, what I think of would have been kind of neat is if um, Stephen Ambrose, who did Band of Brothers, if he would have wrote this. Because in Band of Brothers, you actually have the individual's names. Um, there was no fiction, really, in Band of Brothers. Um, and if you haven't seen Band of Brothers, shame on you. It's probably one of the best uh, World War II depictions of... Uh, uh, 101st Airborne, um, I don't know. Anybody agree that it's an awesome series? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. So how's my credibility so far? So um, uh, he did. Uh, Ambrose died a couple years ago. No, one of the actual members of Oh, um, Wally. Um, Smokey, I think they call him. Um, I'll, I'll think of it. I'm bringing one here. I'm The Winners died. The Winners, that's the one. Yeah. That's it. So, um, I'm an Air Force brat. Um, I was uh, hatched in um, 1952. My dad was uh, in the Air Force at that time. And um, my dad looked like that. Um, we were stationed at Beale Air Force Base and left in 61, uh, a year before this was, was made. So, in the movie Gathering of Eagles, it actually has uh, the housing area uh, near where we lived um, and the lake. Uh, and they panned around to the lake uh, at Beale Air Force Base um, uh, that's kind of uh, at the bottom over the cliff, uh, kind of where the uh, uh, Rock Hudson's house is depicted in that movie. So I got some identity with this. Oh, and there's a small plaque in the parking lot saying that uh, uh, the film was, was done. Anybody by the Beale? Of course. Okay. So I was flying constellations out of uh, out of um, Cloudland Air Base at that time and on a Sunday uh, transition flight I took some enlisted men and so forth and we knew that they they stopped for lunch between twelve and one o'clock 
And so I was flying up there. I told the tower, I want to check the oil. So we came in and we landed and we went in and talked to some of the people. It was a big deal. Now, I wanted to show off how smart I was. Um, this is uh, going back 10 years ago. And I think, Wally, you were there too. And uh, sitting across from me was Jack Templeton. I don't remember Jack. And I would tell him, I'm so smart and all this kind of stuff. And he goes, oh, yeah. Uh, Jack says, I was the one that flew the refueling sequence over Tahoe for, the, for this movie. <laughs> Brought myself back down and, and so on. Um, and Jack passed away about uh, a year and a half ago, but um, I made sure that he told the story of his relationship because it was kind of a, there's a word that goes with a cluster and I, I can't think of it right now. Um, they were trying to decide on how to, uh, how to make the, uh, the filming sequence, and Jack was the one that, that solved that, so one of the old bold pilots. Okay, I'm dying. So, um, so this is kind of a, uh, an inset here. Uh, here's Fort Walton Beach, uh, Florida. Here's um, uh, near Daleville, uh, which is Fort Rucker, uh, where the two um, filming sequences were. So, uh, the crash landing scene that Paul Mance did, and there's another story that goes that way, I mean, so stuff that we can talk about, was done at this airfield. And the opening scene, the nostalgic scene with Dean Jagger, who's on the bicycle, that was actually filmed right there, looking to the north at about 10 in the morning. And, uh, and so this would have, uh, filming would have been in uh, April of 1949. So, Kind of a neat, neat scene there. Uh, so this was the landing scenes. Any of the B-17 uh, kinds of scenes were done there. The other ones were done over here at Duke Field, which is still an airfield. Um, and all this, this was closed off uh, to Eglin Air Force Base. It is, uh, this is a public highway now. And so yeah, there's a gate uh, to get over. But there's, uh, so I, there's a, it was a historian uh, this is about, uh, <coughs> about, eight, about eight years ago, that was doing email communications with the Eglin Air Force Base historian. <coughs> and she had passed a, a bunch of documentation to me that they had brought in Quonset huts. So the Quonset hut uh, was filming was actually done here at Duke Field, but there's nothing preserved in either locations to let you know that a film, uh, film was done there. <coughs> Then uh, Wally and I have um, been uh, to uh, uh, Fox Studios, had the run in Fox Studios for a couple of years. Um, so the librarian uh, let me in, that's where I got to go through several boxes. Um, I got to go walk through the sound, sound stages. Uh, I went to the film uh, library and got to go through stacks and stacks and stacks of, uh, of uh, still photographs. So I got a chance to see some, and I got some of these captured in here. This is where I, where I got that one. Um, so uh, on the set. So this is uh, Century City and uh, Pico Boulevard here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the library is back down over here. Um, and so anyway, uh, Tender on the Fox Studios. Now, there isn't any place else that you're going to actually be able to see this a uh, copy of the actual film dates and where it was filmed. So you've got a string of uh, Florida locations here in April. Um, uh, Wickham Abbey, uh, which was where the Pine Tree Eight Air Force Headquarters, and there's a little story that goes about that, about Eager demanding to take over this. This is the real Wickham Abbey. It was a girls' school um, before the war. It's a girls' school now. And I had a private tour uh, through uh, the, a guy named uh, uh, John uh, Duke uh, gave me a private tour through here. It does not look like this on the inside. It doesn't, it looks, this is the outside, but it doesn't look like that on the inside. There's just, there's, it doesn't have the neat castle-y looking kind of, kind of stuff. So here's the individual dates. Um, so this TWA office that was filmed on this date uh, on Soundstage 6. Uh, it was one of the deleted scenes. So, uh, so this is what it looks like. I mean, it's uh, this is the bedroom uh, where Eager 
Oh, is that? So that's the room? That was a bedroom, and that was a bedroom, and that's what it looks like. And it was kind of, when I went through there in 2009, in July of 2009, it had been rearranged. Um, and so uh, High Wycombe, where the Abbey is, is, there's London and there's High Wycombe, and there's a convenient um, train station, uh, and then kind of to the north, and you can kind of walk down and go to the girls' school. Um, so that was the private tour that I had. Uh, so there's labels above the door that are still there, uh, depicting when Eager was there and then Doolittle was there. And then uh, probably on your bookshelf, uh, a couple of books by Ed Jablonski that talked about uh, the Air Force. And there's a great story that uh, when they started staffing, because um, uh, they had both the operations and crew quarters in the Abbey, well, in the bedrooms, um, there was a pull cord and um, next to the bed, and it said, a ring bell for mistress. So you can imagine what these pilots were doing uh, when they would go in. So it's a great story that's told by uh, Ed Jablonski. So, so where are you going to read about this crap, right? You've got to come here to, to find out about it. So, so here's some cool facts. Um, so uh, this is the, the landing scene, uh, and this was actually taken from the 91st bomb, bomb group, so that was the tail markings. So the guys from the 91st said that uh, the fictional 918th is made up from the 91st bomb group and the 8th Air Force, so you get into an argument, when in fact it was really the 306 they, that they multiplied by 3 to, uh, to get the 918th. Anybody want to get their calculator out and double check? Um, so, Barry Group Peck got a lump sum uh, for uh, about <coughs> six weeks filming, something like that. Probably. For, we paid $100,000 in 1949. Um, when I went to UCLA, I got a chance to see the pay stubs from Henry King. Kind of getting five grand a week in the mid 30s. I mean, that's, I know. He was a pilot. Um, so there's another whole story, I'm still going to on time, another whole story um, about Paul Nance getting into an argument with Henry King. Paulie, what, what was it, five grand, or what was the, the... He wanted five grand, and they said the, the director would do it for 2,500, because he was a pilot himself, so that Nance finally agreed on 2,500. So. Yeah. <laughs> so at UCLA, the dialogue between Henry King and the Air Force went on for six months before they agreed to get the airplanes and get the, the, the scenes in. So there was a tremendous amount of working with the, um, the Pentagon to, to get approval uh, for that. So that's really a great story. Um, the Piccadilly Lily uh, was with the 100 Bond Group, so they reused that name. Uh, Dean Jagger got an Oscar, and then there was another Oscar for the music. Um, the set cost that. Um, I actually have touched the original typed 148-page screenplay. I held it in my hands and I have a copy of it at home. Touched it, it's about that thick. Um, 148 scenes. And then uh, Honolulu, Fort DeRussi. Anybody in there? Okay, so John DeRussi was a rich guy, but he was actually uh, in the 8th Air Force as a, um, a pilot. And he was the technical advisor, so I mean, it's, it's good to be rich. <laughs> We're in a war, a shooting war. But it's not the fight. And some of us have got to die. I'm not trying to tell you not to be afraid. Fear is normal. But stop worrying about it and about yourselves. Stop making plans. Forget about going home. Consider yourselves already dead. Once you accept that idea, it won't be so tough. Now, any man here can't buy it. I discovered Pete more than 10 years ago at, in Oceanside. He was with the 306th in this briefing that was held by Frank Armstrong, who had just joined the group. He'd only been there one day. And told everybody, this is the hard luck group of the 306th. These guys, guys were dying. Uh, the chances of, of getting through three or four missions was about zero. 
and this was the hard luck group. And so they loved Charles Oberacker, um, who was fired. Uh, they brought in uh, Frank Armstrong, and uh, Pete was in that briefing at Thurley. And he said, you have no idea how dejected these guys were. Here they are in their teens, 20s. The chances of them surviving one more mission at that time was about zero. Pete was shot down, um, and is mentioned in the book, um, First Over Germany by Russell Armstrong. He's got a, a few paragraphs dedicated to him. Uh, at Stalag 3, I talked to him on the phone about 10 months ago. He's in um, North Carolina, and was bragging about all the women that, he, uh, that were flocking around him because he's uh, this, this famous vet. So the guy's still pretty sp uh, spry. One thing that's in, in the movie is about the Toby mug. Um, it was in the possession of uh, Frank Armstrong for a little while, this particular mug, but it's, it's lost now. And then Pete said that in the 306, they would, on, on the mantle, they would stack a red book and a green book to indicate whether there was going to be a mission uh, the next day. So when the face is out, uh, they shut down the bar uh, in the movie, and um, so they closed the bar because there was a mission the next day, so that was, that was kind of uh, And supposedly the Toby mug is more common with the British, uh, but I have not heard of any bomb groups that actually used a Toby mug. So this is a Burnley something something, is, is my guess. What do I do with an arm, sir? An arm? Who's on it? Ed Campbell, the top two of them. What happened to the rest of it? He's in a French hospital. I hope. He couldn't have made it home. It was blown out too close to go on a pedigree. So I bailed him out. I put the ring in his good hand. Shoot open. That's all right. I'll take care of it. Sergeant, get me a blanket out of that ambulance. Yes, sir. So, um, this is a depiction uh, of a mission that uh, occurred um, here as part of the 92nd Bond Group with John Morgan, who came back. Uh, he is played by uh, Robert Patton as Lieutenant Bishop. Um, and later on, um, about, uh, I don't know, nine months later, uh, he became a, a POW, but he did get the Medal of Honor uh, for that mission. Um, uh, the, the top gunner did lose his arm. Uh, he survived. Uh, he ended up in Stalag 3. Uh, the guy that plays McElhaney, uh, in reality, was Don Bevan, who was a playwright. He wrote Stalag 17. William Holden. Um, I love that movie. Yeah. Um, and uh, I should give a presentation about that. It's pretty cool. Uh, so anyway, Don Bevan uh, met uh, that gunner that lost his arm in Stalag 3. Uh, but Don Bevan was never officially credited uh, with depicting uh, 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 McElhinney. And uh, Don Bevan was also like a sketch artist. So he did a number of things. He was busted uh, for uh, a number of things. Uh, and he was interviewed by Bruce Orris. Uh, but he just uh, did pass away this, this last year. So, and I'm not aware of anybody that's alive from the movie now. Everybody. 
but it's with the clear understanding that your combat days are over. That old fud like you want to know there. I won't be put in the spot of having to write that letter to your wife. It's new, Padre. Your business is sin. Hereafter, you'll confine your activities to that theater of operations. Is that clear? Yes, sir. was done at um, Anderson Pond. I want to tell you it was named after me, but uh, <laughs> the other Anderson. Yeah, named after us. Um, but uh, so the car is parked there looking off to the uh, to the west. And that's about five miles south of Duke Field. So if you want to go take a look, look at that, it's kind of cool. So these are the uh, stills that I got at uh, USC. Um, there's a web page dedicated to Ira Eaker. Um, he formed the group um, in February of 42, survived until December of 43 when 8th Air Force was just at its worst. P-47s couldn't get to the, to the targets in the back, so um, the, the German fighters would hit them when the P-47s would go back uh, to refuel. And that was in December of 43, just as the P-51s were, were coming on the scene. So what did they do? They fired Eaker and installed Doolittle. So here's Doolittle, Medal of Honor winner, 
gets to inherit the Eighth Air Force right when the P-51s are coming on the scene. I'd say that's a pretty sweet deal. I don't know if anybody knows. So I've got a lot of personal, I actually have this, um, so my personal empathy for Ira Eager, um, because, you know, life ain't fair, right? I mean, the, that's, I mean, certainly he's a, he's a famous guy and, and really accomplished, but um, anyway, this exchange didn't really happen like this. Uh, it actually uh, happened uh, at uh, the 306 uh, Bond uh, at Thurley. And uh, you guys want to take a guess as to how old uh, the actor Millard Mitchell is there? In the scene? Yeah, in the scene. Uh, Millard, I mean, you can do the arithmetic here. But, uh, he's uh, in his 40s. Yeah, 1949? Yeah. 46, 47. If he was in 49, if he was born in 96, that's four years more. No, that's eager. This is the actor Miller. Oh, yeah. Sounds Forty-six years old. Kinda, but isn't that amazing? The guy, you know, I would have sworn. Well, what would you think? He was sixty-something, right? But he's in his forties. He looks twenty years older. Yeah. That's that's the part. Well, anyway, he didn't live much longer. I mean, he uh, he passed away uh, just uh, four years after this. Uh, Um, 
This is the airport uh, where the 306 the bomb group was, uh, just north of the town of Bedford. So you get off the train station here and take a cab up. Uh, after you finish going through the museum, make sure you take a cab back, because if you walk back, you're going to be stopped and told that you can't walk around there, because it's a secure facility, sort of, for researching cars and race cars and all that kind of stuff. So what I ended up doing, uh, they escorted me back uh, to the exit, and I took a, a walk, because I didn't, it was a gorgeous day in July of uh, 2009. And I walked from here over to the edge of this river, and there was a pub, and I just was forced to have a couple of pints um, there. And then I walked from this pub down to this town of uh, uh, Milton, uh, Keynes. And so, um, and so I stopped here, and this turns out to be the hotel called the Queen's Head, uh, where Glenn Miller stayed uh, the night before he went missing. Um, so uh, they showed me the room where he stayed at, and you know this kind of stuff. So. Uh, I gotta tell you, I'm into this. I don't know. It's uh, just fascinating stuff. So, if uh, but there is this museum, and it's uh, it's kind of a labor of love for the the local British guy that runs it. Um, and uh, but it's this museum is good if you don't know that there was a war in, in the 40s. I mean that's so young people that have never heard of Germany or you know um, that there were airplanes back then. You know. It's, I know, it's, I know, we, I guess we've all got, got stories. So I've been hanging around pilots now for a long time, and uh, I can honestly tell you I cannot corroborate a denigrating factual experience that took place in any of the bomb groups that they um, embarrassed or denigrated uh, the pilots. This is fiction, as far as I can tell. Uh, so I've talked about this over with um, uh, Alan Duffin and uh, Russell Strong and those guys, and we all agree that this is, this is kind of fiction. Uh, uh, so I, I, I just got to think this is Psy Bartlett. Uh, so if you were underperforming, you would get stuck uh, at the back of the formation where you were most vulnerable. So both from mm -hmm. flak, uh, adjusting flak levels, and then fighters uh, coming behind. So. Uh, Lord Ha Ha is mentioned um, in the in the movie, uh, so there actually there were several people that actually filled the role of uh, propaganda for Germany. Uh, it just so happens the last guy to do that um, was uh, William Joyce. Uh, so this is when he was captured um, and taken uh, as prisoner uh, back, and then he was hanged for treason uh, at the end of the war. So this was and this says Hee Ha, but I mean it was a uh, mockery, you know of uh, of people that uh, were sympathetic. Uh, this happens to be a, uh, a deleted scene. This is one of the stills that I got uh, from uh, from the film library at uh, USC. No, I'm sorry, at Fox Studios. And then uh, we actually have the date uh, when this is done. And uh, so uh, this was would have happened at the very beginning. So what happened uh, in the screenplay? Uh, he changes his mind. Uh, in the screenplay to not fly back and then goes back into town to, to buy that hat and that's when he in the shop next uh, over to it that was all done on soundstage six is when he uh, saw the Toby mug and so and then uh, if you actually go to the 306 uh, org, uh these are some of the, the pictures there's uh, Charles Overacker uh, and uh, uh, shoot, I forgot these guys' names, but uh, this is the Thurley Airfield, so the museum is just off uh, to, to that side of it. And uh, actually, north north is this way, so the, the museum is over that, that way. So some of the huts and all that. Okay, that's it. Questions? It was the movie popular? Did it make any money? Um, it was, actually. Um, so, uh, it was first aired um, at that really nice theater in Riverside, um, one that's kind of old style. It first airing uh, there, so the preview or not preview? What do they call that? Premiere. Premiere. Yeah, it was uh, done there. Um, but actually, the big uh, thing was actually done in New York City in, in, in 
that kind of thing. So, um, I guess we've got some time here. So, um, I've been hanging out with uh, Eighth Air Force guys uh, for a while now. So, this is uh, one of the guys I was talking about earlier is uh, Jay Walker. Uh, through with the uh, three, uh, 384th Bomb Group. Uh, he went on, to, he's still alive, uh, had a stroke 10 years ago. Um, he went on to build Bellflower Airport in 1946. Anybody fly in and out of Bell, Bellflower? That's just south of LAX. Um, well, that turned out to be a great training. Um, so he had an FBO that he was running out of there, and he met um, Ed Sullivan and uh, Jack Webb and uh, John Wayne. Um, he uh, went on to make uh, quite a bit of money. He used to go up and uh, go up to the Happy Bottom Riding Academy that Pancho Barnes ran up at Miroc Dry Lake, which is now um, Edward. Not Edwards. Yeah, Edwards. And um, so, uh, just stories. Um, he dated uh, Hollywood starless. He dated Betty White. Um, he dated uh, Audrey Hepburn. He was with Audrey Hepburn when she died in Switzerland. Uh, he owned 57 Mercury dealerships at one time. He had a racehorse called the Punicon that was famous in the 50s and out at Hollywood Park. Um, he even admitted to me last year that uh, when he was part of the State Department, he was the one that set up the rendezvous between uh, JFK and Marilyn Monroe. He would, he would, um, you know, buy the hotel room and, and uh, had the cover story. I mean, this guy is he's pretty amazing people. So the guys that I get to hang out with, I can kind of brag a little bit about. One is uh, Kurt Schultz, still alive, uh, flew me 109s for the, uh, for the Luftwaffe station in Norway was late uh, in rescuing the uh, turbots uh, that was uh, sunk in February of 44. Um, and uh, uh, he was court-martialed uh, and his boss committed suicide. Um, so anyway, Kurt's still alive, if you ever want to meet him. Uh, he was featured on Fox uh, News Special uh, that was just uh, aired last month. Um, we have uh, York Sipionka that flew the MQ-62s. This is Oceanside again. And then over Rancho Bernardo, we have um, Steve Bassanos, um, a famous Greek pilot, jumped ship in 1938, uh, flew with Eagle Squadron, went on to become a colonel in the Air Force. And so, got about five minutes left. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Most of the films of this era had a rather positive messaging or kind of culture or something. This, this was the dark darkest part of uh, this campaign. And I'm trying to wonder, why did they make this movie? Why did they show such a dark period? Um, I probably, I, I'm just going to just guess, um, because uh, I, I could have, would have, should have done this 40 years ago. And, I mean, if I, if I would have been inspired to interview those guys is because it was such a, a formative time period that had not really been, Bomber Command uh, was produced with uh, Clark Gable uh, the year before, and uh, so there was discussion to not even write the book because of Bomber Command. Uh, so they went ahead and did this uh, because it was um, formative. I, that's probably the best compelling reason is that there was nothing like it in history since just trying to decide how you were going to do a bombing campaign, the British one. I mean, they were m maintaining a steady state for the most part because they had won the Battle of Britain. So they felt that by the summer of 1940, they were already winning the war because they didn't get invaded. So we came in, what, three years after the 1939 invasion of, of Poland. So um, if, if I'm going to, I'm, I'm alive here speaking for the, uh, for the authors, but I'm going to say it was formative and, and a compelling reason to document it for both the book, the movie, and the TV series. Uh, like I've never got any indication that it was like a tribute to all those people that lost their lives or anything like that. Well, the stress factor, I think, is well captured in this. It certainly is. And so, I think it, this what, movie what, was... Was it a turning point? Yeah, 
I would say so. And there are other turning points from the P-51 came along, as you said. Yeah. Other, I don't know. This couldn't have nothing but a bad end if the P-51 had come along. Good point. I agree. So, I'll hang around afterwards. Um, um, again, timing is everything. Yeah, yeah and that's true. Sure is. But um, this was a lot of fun for me to do this. So, um, but, uh, that's my best buddy. <laughs> Thank you.